Hi everyone, so this is lecture three in CAN 430 process design. Um, in this lecture, so the week three, lecture three, we'll be talking about the heuristics for process synthesis. And by heuristics, we basically mean the general rules which will govern your decision making when trying to develop a base case. So um, September 7th, this is the day when the, this lecture will be released. Um, we'll be covering process heuristics and S1 plus tutorial number two, which will be in a separate video. Um, a few pertinent dates for you guys to note. Homework number one is due next week, September 14th. Uh, most of the solutions have been posted on Blackboard. Um, uh, there might be a solutions video, um, there might not be, but uh, just remember that this homework submission is a group submission, so try to get to with your groups try to get the synergy going, try to get the communication ironed out and um, submit as a group. So only one person will submit it and you know, on their submission, they'll just write the group members. Your project topic selections are due next week. So please remember this. Um, if you don't select the topic, you'll be assigned a random topic. So, uh, you know, take the chance um, if, if you have a preference in mind. Okay. So let's, uh, let's get started. So if you recall from last week, we talked about the operations um, in process synthesis or what are the steps you would take to um, design a base case. And we said the first thing is you're gonna put in your chemical reactor, the heart of your process, in which you're eliminating the differences in molecular types or doing molecular conversion from your raw material to your final product. And then we're gonna add mixing and recycle to try and distribute the chemicals to try and um, you know, understand the points where I mean, might mix, understand the points where I might need to separate um, species from each other. Third point is then I'll add the separation steps. So for example, if, if your um, reactor produces your major product and a byproduct, you would want to add like a separation step, maybe a distillation column, maybe an absorption column, to separate the two species. And then finally, we add our temperature, pressure, and phase change, basically our thermodynamic manipulators, to try and you know if your raw material your um it comes if, for example if you're using crude oil it comes at a very high temperature you want to cool it or maybe your raw material comes at room temperature you want to heat it up for the reactor etc with gases if you want to pressurize a gas you want to um you know depressurize a gas you add these manipulators at your fourth um stage and then finally we do some task integration which is basically trying to optimize the heat transfer usage throughout the process optimize the mass transfer um, between you know your important species to add the process and step number five we'll get to it later in the semester so at this point you should at least have um, you know as senior chemical engineering students you should be able to have some sort of um, feel for steps number one to numbers one to four right and again you're given a problem you need to first of all put all your list of chemicals establish your database understand what your chemicals um, uh, what their nature is, then you identify the best synthesis route by comparing the different routes. Like we talked about um, uh, during the last lecture, there's only one straight answer, just use it. And then you start drawing your basic block flow diagram, which will be the base case. So this lecture will deal with the heuristic rules that expedite the selection and positioning of process operations, right? So there are some, some rules which will help guide your decision making because because while you're doing this, you might have a few points where you're not sure what to do, or you know, um, you might just throw them and ignore some of the best practices. So try to always follow these heuristics or keep them in mind when, when doing your design. Um, these rules are based on experience and generally apply, but uh, usually after building your base case, you're gonna try to verify it using Aspen Plus. And if something doesn't apply, you should always have the judgment to make a decision to um, change it. Okay. Um, and then later on in the semester, as I said, we'll get to algorithmic methods to talk about task integration, optimization, and other things. All right. So the objectives is, so these are the objectives of this lecture. First of all, you need to understand the importance of selecting reaction paths that do not involve toxic or hazardous chemicals, right? When avoidable, right? Um, so you need to keep safety in mind. If there is a toxic chemical, a hazardous chemical, try 
as much as you can to either avoid it or limit its quantity as much as possible. You should be able to distribute the chemicals in, in your process flow sheet, especially in the presence of inert species, because um, inert species exist. You know, if you're, you have oxygen, sometimes you just get air. Air has a whole bunch of nitrogen in it, has a whole bunch of argon. You should be able to deal with inert species, when to purge them, um, etc. You need to be able to apply the heuristics. So, you know, when uh, if, if you have a design process and uh, you placed one unit in front of the other, or you know you, you decided to separate before reactor instead of after reactor, you need to be able to explain it logically, and these heuristics will help guide um, your your logic. And of course, when you have excess reactants, inerts, diluents, whatever, you should be able to distribute them efficiently. And finally, pumping pumping a liquid versus compressing a vapor. Um, we'll get to this during this lecture as well. Okay. So um, let's get started with the first heuristic. So heuristic number one. What is this thing? Okay. Um, you should always select raw materials and chemical reactions to avoid or reduce the handling and storage of hazardous and toxic chemicals. Okay. And um, this comes back to the safety point. If you have the chance of avoiding hazardous or toxic chemicals and following another reaction pathway, you need to take the safer pathway. Okay, this logically always is, is the better thing to do. Um, and this help, makes your process easier to deal with when it comes to control. You don't need to worry about, oh, it's, if I release, it's gonna I'll deal with all types of issues. If it might explode, might this and that. Just avoid it from the start. Save yourself a whole bunch of headache. So for example, remember the manufacture of ethylene or, you know, um, the manufacture of ethylene glycol. So in this case, you have ethylene, you react it with oxygen, you get ethylene oxide, right? And then ethylene oxide plus water will give me ethylene glycol, right? Um, and the issue here is that both reactions are highly exothermic, as you'd expect. You know, I'm, I'm, I'm basically breaking a CH bond and creating an OA, OC bond, whatever it is. And both reactions are highly exothermic. You have to control them carefully. However, you know, a water spill spilled into an ethylene oxide storage tank would lead to an accident similar to the Bhopal incident. So um, Bhopal is one of the biggest uh, safety cases, one of the biggest disasters basically, which happened in, in the 80s, where they had a similar two-step process. They were making pesticides and uh, they had an intermediate as well, and they would store this intermediate in large quantities. However, this intermediate was very, um, uh, let's say, active with water, and they had a small water leak. Intermediate reacted with water, had a huge cloud, went over the next city next to the plant, resulted in a major humanitarian disaster. Okay, so um, usually you would want to minimize this dangerous step. So I, I know this intermediate is very active and um, could result in a thermal runaway and could potentially ha very hazardous. So maybe it's better to just avoid using it completely, right? Um, so this is what the heuristics tells you. So let's look at other pathways for the ethylene glycol process. So in, in, instead, so we're looking at pathways which will help us eliminate this ethylene oxide intermediate, which is very dangerous. Um, so for example, you have one pathway where I can use um, chlorine and NaOH to react with ethylene to give me ethylene glycol directly. Alternatively, um, when ethylene oxide forms, I immediately introduce carbon dioxide to make ethylene carbonate, which is a much more stable intermediate to save, to, sorry, so to store and handle, all right? So try, try to find pathways. And while you're still at the chemistry synthesis route before building any base cases or anything, you, you most of the time you have some leeway with the chemistry because, you know, you have catalysts, you have, you can increase temperature, pressure. There are many things that could do to make the reaction or to achieve the product you want under um, a bunch of different circumstances. So recapping heuristic one, this is, uh, this is the, the most important heuristic. Always try to select raw materials and chemical reactions to reduce the handling and storage of hazardous and toxic chemicals. Whenever you can, 
avoid using or avoid dealing with these chemicals if you have to. So, you know, if you have to try to um, neutralize them or, you know, uh, decrease their danger as much as possible, as in this case where I would just react with CO2, get ethylene carbonate, which is a much less dangerous intermediate. Or if you can just avoid creating it um, altogether, so you could go reaction pathway one, where I just avoid having this ethylene um, oxide um, altogether. All right, heuristic one is done. Now let's look at heuristic two. Um, so heuristic two says use an excess of one chemical reactant in a reaction operation to completely consume a second valuable toxic or hazardous chemical reactant. So what this means is um, if I have one, so let's say I have two reactants, one of them is available and the other one is a very valuable or very toxic or etc. So usually if your reaction does not go to completion, um, you would want to recycle the less expensive chemical to completely use up the more expensive chemical or the less toxic chemical to completely use up the more toxic chemical. So for example, let's look at the um, dichloroethylene production example, which we were talking about um, during the last slide. If you guys remember, I have chlorine, I have ethylene, and I do a two-step type of thing where I do a chlorination step. First of all, I get um, dichloroethylene, and then I basically pyrolyze it at high temperature, high pressure to get my vinyl chloride monomer and get HCl. And last lecture we said, um, you know, we're going to recycle some of the C2H4Cl2 back. Um, and, and when applying the heuristic, we have to keep an eye on chlorine here because chlorine is an extremely toxic chemical, right? It's hazardous, it's toxic. You don't want to have a chlorine release because chlorine is a heavy molecule. So the chlorine cloud is usually very dense, stays close to the ground. So it, it, when it passes by, it's going to, you know, affect um, people standing on the ground level. So you want as much as possible to not have excess chlorine just roaming around this process. Um, so what, what could you do? So usually you could add excess ethylene here and then separate it and try to recycle it. However, you need to make a decision where should you put your separation point. Um, so one, one example, well, one way to approach this would be, you know, I'm going to add ethylene and then I'm going to separate the ethylene here from my dichloroethylene and recycle it back to eat up all the remaining chlorine in the process. So that by this point before entering the pyrolysis reaction, I don't have any chlorine. You might have some ethylene, it's fine, but you eliminate the chlorine completely. Right, so the logic here is um, if I have two raw materials or maybe at any point in the process, I have a reactor where the feed into the reactor contains one chemical which is less or one chemical which is very valuable, very toxic, very hazardous. You want to perform a recycle step so that you can completely get rid of this chemical before moving on to the next step. And the decision whether to separate at this point, decision whether to separate um, ethylene at this point, or maybe separate chlorine at this point, or maybe add a second reactor here, whatever it is, will depend at the end of the day on economics. But the logic is I have chlorine coming in here. By this point, by halfway through the process, I want chlorine to be completely, by this point, by halfway, you know, after the step, I, won't, I don't want to have any more chlorine um, in, in my process. So this is heuristic number two. Valuable toxic hazardous chemicals, you want to get rid of them as much as possible through a recycle separation step. Okay, heuristic number three. When nearly, when nearly pure products are required, eliminate inert species before the reaction operations, when the separations are easily accomplished, or when the catalyst is adversely affected by the inert. Okay. So what this means is, let's say I have A plus B react to give me E plus F, and um, I have an impure feed here, C and D. You know, um, so often impure stream, impure feed streams contain significant concentrations of species that are inert. You know, for example, if you have air, it has you, you're interested in the oxygen reacting, but oxygen comes with nitrogen, comes with argon comes with a whole bunch of junk. 
Um, if you're reacting, for example, coal, coal will have all types of junk which are inert, but these inert um, species might affect your catalyst, for example. So um, if you have some sulfur in, in, in your feed, and this is very common when dealing with hydrocarbons, for example, if you have coal or natural gas, you usually have trace amounts of sulfur, and this will end up damaging your catalyst, corroding your equipment, and it's inert throughout most of your process. So ideally, you want to eliminate it at some point before the reactor, or you can let it pass through the first reactor and eliminate it at some point before the second reactor, whatever it is. But um, the idea is when you, need, when you need a pure product, I need to get rid of this inert species um, before the reaction, before the reaction operation, okay? So let's look at, at a few cases here. And of course, you should not do this when large exothermic heat of reaction must be removed. So again, let's recap. So if I have, to, if, I have um, if I have a feed with an inert impurity entering into a reactor, I need to remove this inert impurity before the reactor, except if the reaction is highly exothermic, then I would want to remove it after the reactor because the inert species helps helps you to control the temperature within the reactor. Okay, so let's have a look here. Um, so you need to decide whether to remove the inerts before the reaction. So in this case, I have A plus B react to give me A plus F, and as well C and D. Um, a basically, then A reacts also with C to give me E, and I need the pure product E right here. However, D is an inert, it has no, it doesn't play any role in this reaction. So you need to make a decision whether to remove D at this point before the reactor or to remove D after the reactor, right? And um, the way to make this decision really depends on, on your economics and the type of reaction which is happening. If the reaction is not exothermic um, and D has an effect on, on the catalyst, then you should always remove it before the reactor. Um, it also depends on the concentration of D. So for example, if, if C is oxygen and D is nitrogen, this 21%, this is 79%, you know, and um, it's a gas phase reactor, might make sense to remove it before the reactor to minimize your sizing costs. Alternatively, if the reaction is very highly exothermic, so, uh, or highly exothermic, where you get a lot of heat released, then it makes sense to keep this inert in the reactor to help control, um, control the temperature inside your unit, right? Because I have a, have a large um, concentration of species which does not take part of the reaction. However, it contributes to the heat capacity, so it will help control the temperature of this reactor. So it might make sense to actually keep D in the reactor and then separate the hot D after the reactor and then you can recycle it and do some integration activities with it later. And uh, the ease and cost of separation must be assessed, of course, and this can be accomplished by examining the physical properties of separation and you might need to use some simulation. And we're gonna talk about separation trains in the next lecture. So let's, um, let's, re let's revisit this uh, heuristic three before we move on. So the idea is if you need a pure product, so for example, I have A plus B going in and I have C and D going in into a two reaction step process and I need to extract E and F as my products, I need them to be pure products, right? And um, we know that A and B are pure, they're fine. C, um, D is a diluent or it's an inert species. It does not take part in the reaction, but it comes with C as is. So what you do is I need to get rid of this inert um, species at some point in this process. Um, and the decision to, so the decision is made, you have to get rid of this inert. Whether to take it before the reaction or after the reaction depends on the nature of, of, of this inert species and the nature of the reaction itself. So if D, sorry, is, um, for example, if, if, if D is, um, uh, affects the catalyst in a negative way, you need to get rid of it before the reactor. If the reaction is highly exothermic, then it might make sense to keep D until after the reaction to help control the temperature and then separate it after the reactor. Um, alternatively, if D is, is a 
is a huge part of this feed. Might make sense to remove it before the reactor to minimize your unit costs um, versus letting it zip through a very large unit, um, et cetera. And as you can see, there are many choices which have, you can make. Um, and all these choices lead to the same conclusion, which is D, you need to get rid of this impure inert species at some point. And the decision whether to remove it before or after will depend on your economics, will depend on your process conditions, and you will have some sort of design tree which you need to make um, a judgment call about it. But definitely, you should never produce a product with a lot of inerts in it um, if, if your specs require a pure product. All right, sounds good. So heuristic number four, um, you need to introduce liquid and vapor per streams to provide exits for species that enter the process as impurities or are produced by irreversible side reactions um, when, this, when these species are in trace quantities or are difficult to separate from other species. So if you recall from Ken 200, um, the idea of having a purge stream is um, to avoid accumulation of a certain component in your process because um, let's have a look at an example here. So your ammonia synthesis loop, I think this is a very simple example to show this point. So in ammonia, you have nitrogen, will react with hydrogen to make ammonia, which is NH3. It's a very, um, very widely applied reaction. However, nitrogen comes with trace argon, hydrogen comes with trace CH4. So how, how do you get rid of, uh, how do you get rid of these trace elements, argon and CH4? So first of all, nitrogen and so they both enter the process. You have your reactor, you get ammonia, then you have some con a partial condenser to try and separate the unreacted species from your ammonia. And you can easily separate pure ammonia. And in the stream right here, um, in the stream, in the top stream, you will have your nitrogen, you will have your hydrogen, which are unreacted and you want to recycle them, recycle them back to your reactor. However, the nitrogen and hydrogen, they are unreacted, but they also have trace argon and trace CH4. So if I recycle them, the nitrogen and hydrogen get used up. However, this argon and CH4 don't react, so they start accumulating in my process. So in order to avoid this accumulation, where now I start having argon and CH4 as 5% or whatever it is, and they start affecting your heat transfer, you start affecting your mass transfer, you need to purge them out of your system. So I need to introduce a slipstream in which I just get rid of all these species into the atmosphere. Um, and uh, this is very common practice. You should always keep an eye on your trace quantities in your feed. Um, and if you have a trace quantity and you have a recycle loop, you should always purge, okay? And of course, it depends on the economics. Um, it depends on uh, whether it's highly toxic. It depends on whether it's a highly valuable species, whatever it is. So if I have H2S here, for example, I can't purge H2S because it's extremely toxic. If you have some sort of cyanide, you cannot purge cyanide. You will need to add extra separation steps, to, which will cost you a lot more money, of course, makes the, pro, you know, increase um, the, the overall capital cost. However, sometimes you just need to separate it. But in other cases, it also depends on the concentration, right? So if, and, and the volume. So you can't really purge a lot of CH4 in, in an ammonia plant. Um, usually you would flare it or whatever it is. However, the general idea is that when you should always deal with these trace elements. You cannot just let them accumulate in your process. And when developing a base case, it's always a good idea to just add a purge initially and then deal with this purge later on in your detailed design. Okay, so if you're building a base case for your projects and you notice that you have a trace element, I need, you, I need to see that you're acknowledging that this trace element is gonna accumulate and you're gonna purge it. Okay, and heuristic five just goes back to talk about what I just mentioned. You should never purge valuable species or species that are toxic or hazardous, even in small concentrations. So if, if this species, inner trace species which is accumulating in your process is very expensive or very toxic, very hazardous, you should not purge it. You should always add separators to try and reco recover these species, or you can add some reactors to try and eliminate, eliminate them, convert them to some other safe molecule which you can dump. 
So for example, your catalytic converter in the car exhaust system, in your car you have fuel, you have air, you go to your combustion system engine, whatever it is, diesel, whatever, um, they combust and you get carbon monoxide, water, and NaOx, um, NOx. you also get SOx, whatever, and other, um, of course, other junk as well. However, NOx is extremely harmful, very toxic, very hazardous. Carbon monoxide is also toxic, hazardous to humans. So you, you cannot just you cannot just purge them out of your system. Even if I recycle some of the fuel back, I can't just purge carbon monoxide and NOx. So most cars have a small catalytic converter, which converts these um, toxic chemicals into benign chemicals, let's say, for human health. And you just release it to the atmosphere, CO2 and nitrogen, and they just get released. So let's let's recap heuristics number four and five. Heuristic number four, if you have an inert species or a trace species entering your process, you need to keep an eye on it. And if you're recycling your reactants or you don't have full conversion, whatever, it's not a one-pass system, you would either you would need to purge it, except in cases when this trace element is toxic or hazardous, then you would need to deal with it either through a reaction step or a separation step. Okay move on. Um, heuristic number six, byproducts that are produced in reversible reactions in small quantities are usually not recovered in separators or purged. Instead, they are recycled to extinction. extinction. Okay, so what this means is that if I have a reversible reaction and I have a byproduct which is produced in a small quantity, um, it, it does not make economic sense to purge it, right? I can just introduce it back or recycle it back into my system and use it to drive the reaction forward, okay? So let's have a look here. Um, often small quantities of chemicals are produced inside reactions. And if the reaction is irreversible, and again, this is very important, your reaction has to be reversible. So you need to have, a, again, you know, if you recall from kinetics, reversible reaction, just A goes to R, one pass goes directly, with a certain conversion. However, a reversible reaction, you have an equilibrium type of, um, you have equilibrium concentrations, equilibrium conversions in your reactor. So all the species will coexist at equilibrium. Um, however, there is no, the change in number of moles is equal to zero. When the reaction proceeds irreversibly, small quantities of byproducts must be purged. Otherwise they will build up in the process continuously until the process must be uh, shut down, okay? So again, if, it's, if the reaction is irreversible, we go back to heuristic number four. I need to purge these um, small quantities. I need to purge these byproducts. I need to get rid of them. However, if your reaction is reversible, you will need to recycle these byproducts to extinction, okay? So when the reaction proceeds reversibly, it becomes possible to achieve an equilibrium conversion at steady state by recycling your product species without removing them from the process. Um, and this is called recycle to extinction. And uh, if, if you come through across an example in which you have um, a trace amount in a reversible reaction, reversible process, just remember that you're, we're not gonna purge it, we're just going to recycle it. If it's irreversible, we have to purge it, okay? So just heuristics to guide your design when doing your base case. Um, and these are just good practices for doing so. Okay, heuristic number seven. For competing <clears throat> series or parallel reactions, adjust the temperature, pressure, and catalyst to obtain high yields of the desired products. Um, so this means that, I mean, this seems like intuitive, but if you have competing reactions, you have series reactions, you have parallel reactions, you need to play with your kinetics, basically your temperature, pressure, catalyst to get the product you want, all right? So let's look at an example. So for example, you want to make allyl chloride. Um, in this process, I react dichloropropane, reacts with um, chlorine, where I get allyl chloride. However, allyl chloride also reacts with chlorine to give me dichloropropene. So, so what happens here is I have my, um, sorry, this is not dichloropropene. Um, this propylene actually, yeah. So this propylene, 
So in order to make allyl chloride, I have propylene, which reacts with chlorine to give me allyl chloride plus HCl. However, I have two side reactions here. The first one is propylene reacting with Cl2 and then um, reacting with Cl2 to give me another byproduct, which is dichloropropane, as well as allyl chloride also reacting with Co2 to give me another byproduct, which is dichloropropene. So um, if I have this system of reactions or this system of um, this kinetic system, basically, and I want to maximize the production of allyl chloride while minimizing the production of dichloropropane and dichloropropene. So how do you achieve this? You achieve this by playing around with your temperature, your pressure, your kinetics, et cetera. Um, and let's, let's have a look here. So this is, this is what we were saying. Um, propylene what can give me dichloropropene or give me allyl chloride. And allyl chloride can further react to give me dichloropropene. We want to maximize the yield of allyl chloride. So we need to look at the kinetics. So what, what we're gonna do now, I'm gonna look at the kinetics of this reaction. I'm gonna look at the kinetics of this reaction. And I'm gonna look at the kinetics of this reaction. Now, if you recall, um, you know, kinetics depend on the concentration, depend on the concentration, uh, depend on the concentration, sorry, depends on your action rate constant. Your reaction rate constant depends on the temperature. So we have some sort of temperature dependence. And if it's a gas phase, you also have a pressure dependence. So there is a way to somehow play around with these concentrations, play around with these temperatures and pressures to achieve, um, to maximize the yield of a certain species. So if we take a look at the kinetic data here, um, and if you recall, you know, K equals K naught E to the minus, Delta H over RT. Here we go. Good. Um, so if you recall, the your kinetic um, rate constant usually has a pre uh, pre exponential um, constant, and then it's a function of your um, enthalpy of reaction or your you know um, your heat of reaction, activation energy, whatever you want to call it, and your temperature. Okay. It's actually minus E over RT, right? So K, okay, your reaction rate constant is equal to K naught E to the minus E over RT. This is your activation energy. This is your temperature. This is your pre-exponential -pre constant. And this is just your enthalpy of reaction, okay? So what we're gonna do is we're gonna look at the three reaction rate constants and we'll use this K as a guide to how, to the extent of the reaction. Because if you recall, let's say, I'm looking at this species, I'm gonna call it A. So dA by dT will be equal to K CA maybe. CCL2, whatever it is. So if I can change the temperature somehow to control the K, then I can maybe maximize K1, minimize K2, and minimize K3, right? And of course, this will be K1 minus, uh, or you know, uh, minus K1 minus K2, and then you can uh, get K1 in terms of K3. So you can get a whole expression for this case. But the idea is that if I maximize K1 and I minimize K2 and K3, I can maximize the yield of this species right here. So I have my, uh, so I get my kinetic data and uh, we'll just compare the equation. So what I'm gonna do is I'm plotting lin K versus one over T. Um, so basically if you recall your equation, K equals, K equals K naught e to the minus delta H of RT. If I take lin of both sides, I get lin K is equal to lin K naught plus minus E or minus E over RT. So lin K versus one over T will give me a straight line. And this is what we're plotting. We're plotting lin K versus one over T. And you should have seen this type of you know plot in the chemist in your chemistry courses before. Um, so I have link K1, link K2, link K3. I plotted these three lin lines. 
And I can see that they all cross intersect at a bunch of points. And there are points in which K3 is the is basically the highest. And then there are points in which K2 is the highest. And there are points in which K1 is the highest, right? And I can use this sort of chart to help guide my um, decision making as to what temperature I should operate in to maximize K1. So what range, what's what range of operating temperatures favor the production of allyl chloride? So if you recall, allyl chloride is K1. So the temperatures at which K1 is the maximum and K2 or K1 is higher than K2 and K3 is your temperature of is the temperature at which you should operate and it seems to be within this range right somewhere between this range this is where k1 is greater than k2 and k3 right and uh, if we have a look here okay it seems that i misread the curve so yeah because the red line goes all the way here as well um so this is the temperature range which you should operate in Okay, so again, let's uh, let's recall this heuristic. What what is it saying? So if you have competing series and parallel reactions, and you want to maximize one product, you should always adjust the temperature and pressure catalyst to get the desired product you want. Usually, the easiest thing to change is the temperature, as long as you're not, as long as you're not, you know, crossing the boiling point or crossing the critical point of any of the species. You could manipulate the temperature um easily right and we looked at this example here i have uh, propylene i want to get allyl chloride from propylene and however there are two competing reactions the first one makes dichloropropene and the second one makes dichloro oh, sorry the first one makes dichloropropane and the second one makes dichloropropene i have the kinetic rate expression or I have the kinetic expressions kinetic constants for all three of them I also have the kinetic data for all three of them, so I can compare them directly as a function of temperature. So you plot them as a function of temperature here. So if you plot them as a function of temperature, green line is K3, link K3, red line is K1, blue line is K2. You can clearly see that they overcross at each point. So if you want to maximize, um, um, the product from k3 maybe you want to operate in this region if i want to maximize the product i'm looking for i would like to operate in this region if i want to maximize another product i could operate in this region right so temperature controlling the temperature will help me guide the reaction to maximize the yield of the product i want sounds good so let's go to heuristic eight um for reversible reactions consider conducting them in a separation device capable of removing the products and hence driving the reaction to the right. Um, so this heuristic is sort of an advanced heuristic and it's the basis of process separation. And what this says is you should try to, if you have a reversible reaction, it might be a good idea to use um, reactive distillation, for example, where you have a combined reaction and separation system. Where you know, if you, if you remember Le Chatelier's principle, if I have a reversible reaction, um, if if I continuously remove the products, then the reaction will be driven forward towards the uh, right hand side, right? And this is the idea of it. So if I combine reaction and separation, and I'm constantly removing or separating the product, then the reaction will keep on, will keep um, being pushed to the right hand side. Your equilibrium will be closer to the reactant side. This is the idea of this heuristic. So, for example, manufacture of um, uh, methyl acetate, so methyl acetate with reactive distillation. I have, you know, acetic acid, methyl, what's, what's this? MeOH plus acetic, acetic acid will give me methyl acetate plus water. So, um, usually, I, you know, typically, the way classically you would design it is I'd have this in a reactor and then I'll have a separation step after it and then I'm going to recycle the unreacted products here to try and push the reaction forward by introducing more product. However, if you conduct this in a separation, in a sort of a combined reaction separation step, then you're always removing this product online. So you're always trying to push the reaction forward or pushing your equilibrium towards the right. And um, 
you know, you have this reactive distillation. It's sort of an advanced unit. We won't get to it much, but um, it, 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 it gets used um, in, in a bunch of industries. Oil and gas uses it um, quite extensively. Okay, moving on, heuristic number nine. Heuristic number nine, you should always separate liquid mixtures using distillation and stripping towers and liquid-liquid extractors among similar operations. So if you have liquid mixtures, try to remove them using a distillation column or a stripping tower or liquid-liquid extractors, okay? Um, so if I have two feeds, reaction system, and I get a liquid product with two species in it and I want to separate them, use a liquid separation system. And basically this um, goes down to identifying the correct uh, separation technology for dealing with liquid species, right? Um, so you don't want to have a membrane for dealing with liquid species. You don't want to have filtration for dealing with liquid species. It's just a waste of money um, and a waste of time. So you select from distillation, enhanced distillation, stripping towers, liquid, liquid extraction, etc. Okay, heuristic 10. If you have vapor mixtures, if possible, you should always try to condense them in, with cooling water and then use heuristic 9, right? So if I have vapor mixtures and I want to separate them, it's always better to condense them into liquid and then use the liquid separation techniques we talked about in heuristic 9 to separate them to the products. This is because separating gas mixtures, especially in very large quantities, will require you to use a membrane or will require you to use, um, you know, membrane is the most common one. Um, and, and, and membranes can be very expensive. They result in a very high pressure drop, etc. So for example, if I have a bunch of feeds going into a reactor system and I get vapor products, so what I would do is I would face split them. So basically cool down my products to get my liquids. And I, I would introduce my liquids to a liquid, sep liquid separation system, sorry, where I would recycle back my whatever needs to recycle, purge any type of um, trace, trace chemicals which are accumulating, and I would get my products. And then the vapor, I would have a vapor recovery system where I'd further liquefy as much as I can, and the rest I would either be there, they would either be my gas products or things to purge or things to recycle, okay? So again, heuristic number nine, liquid mixtures, use the right technology for separating liquid mixtures. When you have gas mixtures, as much as possible, if po as much as possible, you would have to liquefy them before in order to separate them effectively. All right, you you should not try to separate um, a gas mixture while keeping it within the gas phase. Even if you use um, reverse distillation, one of them will have to drop to a liquid phase. Okay, so heuristic ten: if you're separating gas gaseous mixture, you would always have to condense them somehow and cooling water. So this says cooling water because it's the cheapest one, you know, it's an old heuristic. Um, however, you can use cryogenics. You could use, you know, playing with the Joule-Thompson coefficient to, to cool it, um, et cetera. So yeah, I should try to attempt it. And then you select from partial condensation, cryogenic distillation, adsorption, absorption, whatever, membrane separation to try and um, further separate your products. And then for your liquid, the separation technologies for the liquid are distillation, enhanced distillation, you know, stripping, liquid extraction, etc. All right. So heuristic number eleven: <clears throat> separate vapor mixtures using partial condensers, cryogenic distillation, absorption towers, absorbers, etc. So basically, what this says, you need to use the right technology for separating vapor mixtures. Okay. Um, and you need to be aware what which separation technology applies to which phase we're gonna have a whole couple of lectures talking about separations but this is something to keep in mind so again for example this is the combination of the previous two flow sheets and the idea is that i have liquid separation system and a gas separation system i would not use the same technology in both right so there are technologies which are used for vapor or gas systems technologies which are used for liquid systems 
All right, let's uh, let's start talking about heat transfer and reactors. So there are a bunch of heuristics dealing with that. Um, <clears throat> so let's start talking about exothermic reactions. We're going to talk about heat heat exchangers and heat exchanger systems in detail later on, but for now let's just provide some heuristics on how to do, deal with them. <clears throat> so in order, so heuristic number twenty one something to remember as well. In order to remove highly exothermic heat of reactions from a system, you should consider using excess reactant and inner diluent and cold shots. These affect the distribution of chemicals and should be inserted early in the process synthesis. Okay, so if I have a highly exothermic reaction and I want to control this heat or I want to remove this heat, you should try to use the excess reactant to um, cool this down, or maybe if you have a inner diluent, most commonly nitrogen, which comes in with oxygen, you can use it to try and control this highly exothermic reaction, or cold shots. We're going to talk about cold shots in a second. Reverse The reverse of heuristic number one is heuristic 22, in which for less exothermic heats of reaction, you need to circulate um, reactor fluid to an external cooler, or use a ejected vessel or cooling coils, okay? So if you have less exothermic heats of reaction, you usually, um, it, it does not make economic sense to just um, recycle your excess reactant or recycle your diluent or introducing um, cool shots. Might make more sense to actually just add ejected vessel or add a cooling coil or use an external cooler to try and cool off your system, okay? So we're gonna talk about these in details, heuristic number 21. To remove a highly exothermic heat of the heat of reaction, consider using your excess reactant of A and B reacting very high or highly exothermic reaction in this reactor, and I then I introduce them to separator. In this separator, of course, I'm going to have some sort of thermodynamic change where I either cool them, you know, cool them or introduce a solvent, whatever it is. However, the B coming out of the separator will be at a lower temperature. I will cool it further and then I would introduce it back to the reactor to help control the high exothermicity of this reaction. Alternatively, you can use an inner diluent. So I have A and B coming in the reactor and, I, um, and then the products go to a separator. I could introduce a diluent which keeps on circulating in my system, right? So S here enters the reactor, it's, um, it helps control the temperature and then I can easily separate it, cool it again and keep it looping in my system. And this is called an inert diluent. Alternatively, you could use cool shots where you know, I divide this reactor into three steps, or maybe if it's a big um, packed bed reactor, I could basically um, feed the cold feed at three different points. And this way it helps me better control the temperature distribution and helps me control the exothermicity of the unit. So again, heuristic number 2221, for highly exothermic heat of reactions, consider using one of these three things. Heuristic number 22, for less exothermic heats of reaction, circulate a reactor fluid to an external cooler or use ejected vessel or cooling coils or use intercoolers, whatever it is. So if it's less ex exothermic, maybe I can, you know, take some, uh, you know, at some part of the reactor, I would have like a cooling jacket or maybe I would have an intercooler where I'm just slightly cooling these products to keep the temperature under control, but I'm not doing something major. I'm not using a second unit to separate, cool and recycle. I'm just doing my cooling sort of in-house. Okay. So for example, um, TVA designed for energy ammonia synthesis converters. So this is a typical example for this type of thing. Um, TVA is Tennessee Valley Authority. It's, it's one of the biggest um, power chemical companies um, in, in the US. And um, they have their own reactor design for ammonia synthesis. Or as you can see, the feed gas, so the feed gas enters here, it passes up through tubes which have catalysts in them um, in contact with particles. And then um, they be, so what happens here is this, so, okay. So the feed gas enters, it goes up between these tubes, it goes to the top, and then it enters these packed tubes where I have catalyst, and then the product comes out from these packed tubes. 
and these and the reaction which happens in these packed tubes is highly exothermic. So the way you know, the way they designed this reactor with my feed gas is usually cooled. It enters the reactor, um, and as it as it's passing up, it takes away some of the heat from the exothermic reaction happening in these packed uh, tubes. Once it gets to the top, it's at a high enough temperature, and then it enters into the packed tubes. The reaction happens it's highly exothermic. The heat gets released to the to the gas, cooled gas, which is passing up, and then the products come down from the bottom. So this is the type of uh, um, you know type of approach to try and control heat exothermicity in a new in a new reactor. And of course, this reaction is not highly exothermic. This is why this applies. Um, and you know this comes back to heuristic twenty one versus heuristic number twenty two. If it's a highly exothermic, this would not have worked. I would have had to take my products, separate them, and then recycle or you know introduce some other cooling element. However, because it's not highly exothermic, I can use this sort of design manipulation where this is basically like a cool shots approach or um, or an intercooling approach to try and cool the reaction um, while the reactor is operating. <clears throat> okay. Let's move on. Endothermic reactions are very similarly treated. So to control temperature for highly endothermic heat of reactions, you either use the excess reactant as diluent or hot shots, right? So it's just the reverse of everything. And for less endothermic heats of reaction, you can use a reactor fluid um, to an external heater or use ejected vessel with heating coil. Okay. Now, this one is very important. This is one of the more important heuristics. Um, to increase the pressure of a system, you should always pump a liquid instead of compressing a gas um, because it's always much less expensive to pump a liquid than to compress a vapor. Okay, so if you have a choice where you want to increase the pressure of a stream, you should always aim to pump a liquid versus compressing a gas because it's much more or much less expensive, right? Um, so again, the two cases are here. I have vapor, I add a condenser, turn it to condense it to a liquid, pump the liquid, and then evaporate it to a vapor phase again. Even though I have two more units, this operation is much more, uh, is, is um, less expensive than just compressing the vapor directly, okay? So again, if you want to increase the pressure of your system, should always pump the liquid instead of compressing your gas. Um, and you know, thermodynamically, if you're interested, you know, pumping or compression work is given by W is integral P1 to P2 VDP, um, which is a function of V, which is much lower for liquids compared to gases, right? So pumping or compression work, this is your equation. And if I if I reduce this V somehow, so for a liquid, this V is very small, whereas for a gas, your volume is very large. Um, this means that I would exert a lot less work, which means a lot less energy consumed, which means much cheaper. So again, remember this, because this is something um, very easy to neglect. It's more efficient to pump a liquid than to compress a gas. And if you do your base case design, you do some economics and you find out you're, you have a small plant which costs you uh, $10 billion, then you know, these are the points which you need to keep an eye out for. Okay, so there, therefore it's always preferable to condense a vapor, pump it, vaporize it rather than compress it. And of course, except in the case of refrigeration. And if refrigeration means, you know, if, if thermodynamically this vapor needs you to go to a very extremely low temperature to turn to a liquid, then maybe it's not worth it. Uh, a common one would be sometimes oxygen, for example, where oxygen need to go um, to extreme temperatures below zero to get to liquid oxygen. So it's not worth it, just, you know, just compress it because these coolers and the evaporators start becoming too expensive. But for most other chemicals, it's usually better to do this operation than to compress your gas. And of course, most commonly is LNG, liquefied natural gas, huge industry. Um, you know, you, you drill in the ground, you get gas, you know, natural gas, which you use for cooking, you use for, you know, to turn on your lights, whatever it is. 
And uh, however, this gas is transported as a liquid called LNG. And they get this gas from the ground, they put it through a, it's called a liquefaction train. And in this liquefaction train, you basically cool it through a bunch of stages. You basically condense it, pump it, condense it, pump it, condense it, pump it, and you get a final liquid at the end. The liquid, you ship it to your, uh, whoever is buying it. And then over there, they could vaporize it again and use it because it's much cheaper than just extending a gas pipeline. Okay, let's move on. Um, there are also a whole bunch of other heuristics, you know, there are 50, 60, bunch of them. Um, and they keep on increasing with experience. As you work as a process engineer, get more experience, you start understanding more, or start getting a better feel, feel, for them and they cover all types of areas. So for example, granular solids, where you have solid dealing with solids, pneumatic conveying, if you have particle sizes, um, if you have solid particles, heat exchangers, furnaces, vacuum, all types of heuristics. I'm gonna post um, this chapter from the book by Cedar, you know, for your reading, for your interest. And you can go over it if you want, you can try and browse it and, and see what, what these heuristics refer to however. Um, for your exam, I would usually give you a multiple choice portion where you're only responsible for the ones we discussed here in details. Okay. Okay, so this will go into details for uh, in details about an example. I'm just talking about heuristic number three. <clears throat> so we just uh, have a few slides left. Let's do this example. So heuristic number three, if you recall, when nearly pure products are required, you should always eliminate the inert species before the reaction, before the reaction operations, if the separation is easily accomplished, or if the catalyst is adversely affected by the inert, right? So what this means if I have a, an impure inert here, or an inert which does not inert or trace element or whatever, which does not take part of in the reaction, it's always a good practice to try and remove it before the reactor. As long as the separation is easily accomplished. And you would also have to remove it before the reactor if this inert species damages your catalyst in any way. And you should not do this when you have large exothermic heats of reaction, because you know if, if, you're, if, you, if your reactor is highly exothermic and I remove the inert, then I'm sort of violating heuristic number 21, where you use the inert to cool down your reactor. Okay, <clears throat> so let's look at an example here. To satisfy the Clean Air Act of 1990, gasoline must have minimum oxygen atom content of two mole per percent. The most common source of this oxygen is methyl tertiary, tertiary butyl ether, MTBE, which is manufactured by the reaction CH3OH plus isobutene will give me MTBE. You know, gasoline must have some sort of oxygen content. So the way, you know, um, these companies get, get around as they sneak in some MTBE in there and they say, look, uh, we added our oxygen into our blend. And the way to make MTBE, you take CH3OH plus isobutene to make MTBE. And you're given a prompt, it is desired to construct an MTBE plant at your refinery located on the Gulf Coast of Texas. Methanol will be purchased and isobutene is available in a mixed C4 stream that contains the following. So. Um, I think it's clear, you know, you're gonna, so for this reaction I have, I need methanol, methanol sorry, I need isobutene to make MTBE. Um, you're gonna build a plant for MTBE, methanol, you can just buy it directly. And isobutene is available, however, it comes with a bunch of other junk. So your isobutene stream also has one butene, has one three butadiene which are impurities in, 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 this, in this process. So what you need to do is, I need to get rid of them somehow, right? Talking about heuristic number three, I would need to get rid of these two before performing this reaction. However, if you remember, we talked about there were some contingencies. The reaction has to be easily accomplished as well, does, does do they affect, adversely affect the catalyst? And the third thing is, is this reaction highly exothermic? So let's have a look at these three things and see if, if it's worth it to remove these, these guys before the reaction. Okay, so the first thing we do is we plot. So we look how, easily, how easy is it to separate these three species. 
And to do so, to find out whether it's easy to separate species or not, you need to have a pressure temperature curve or have a frac, you know, PT curve, PXT, TXY, na -na -na, all the stuff you cover in, in your mass transfer course. But in this case, I'm plotting vapor pressure versus temperature. And as you can see here, butadiene is the red line, isobutene is the blue line, <clears throat> and 1-butene is the green line, and MTB is the black line right here. And we calculate the alphas, which is basically the ratio between the vapor pressure of these three butene species versus that of the MTB. And the idea, why am I doing this, is just to get an understanding of the relative volatility of these three species. And um, it seems here that there is, you know, this is five, this is 4.96, this is four, there's a, there's a jump between these three species. So it seems that it's easy to separate isobutene, so it might make sense to separate it before the reactor. So as you can see here, 1,3-butadiene and 1-butene can be separated by distillation before or after the reaction operation, right? Because the separation is very easy, their alpha values are, are relatively higher at, you know, by 20% at least, or maybe 25% depends on your base um, from your isobutene, so they can be easily separated. However, before making this decision, I'm gonna look at the two other contingencies, which is their impact on the catalyst, the volumes of the reactor in the distillation tower and the temperature levels in the exothermic reactors, um, in the exothermic reactors, okay? So for heuristic number three, I want to remove my inerts. However, I need to take keep an eye on the other considerations such as their effect on the catalyst. Is this reaction highly exothermic? And you know, if, if separating this is gonna cost me a, a huge distillation complex, then economically it might not make sense okay so this is the first example talking about heuristic number three just these are the types of decisions or types of scenarios will you're gonna um come across okay let's have a look at another example here <clears throat> consider the reaction distillation operations for isomerization isomerization of m-butane to isobutane according to the reaction so as you can see here, I have n-butane going to isobutane. It's a reversible reaction, first thing you can see. And um, you're being told that the feed to, to the process is a refinery stream, which contains 20 moles of isobutane. Okay, so you have a feed with 20 mole percent isobutane, isobutane, sorry. And you're being asked to show the alternatives for positioning of the reactant reaction and distillation operations. Okay. So take a minute and think about this. So I have n-butane going to isobutane according to the reaction, according to this reversible reaction. However, the feed coming in has 20% isobutane, 20 mole percent isobutane. And you need to decide, how am I gonna do this? Am I gonna separate the isobutane at the start? Or am I gonna let this react and maybe separate it at the end? Or am I gonna do this in one unit where I actively separate the isobutane? You have a bunch of different options here. What's the best way to come around this decision? Let's have a look at option number A. So option number A, I take my feed, which contains n-butane and isobutane. I react them normally in my reactor, and then I separate the isobutane here, which is the desired product. And then I recycle back the n-butane um, into my feet. Okay, so I'm just, I'm just dealing with this 20 mole percent in the feed as is, it's fine. Let's have a look at option number B, where I introduce my feed with n-butane and isobutane. I have a separation step at the start where I basically get rid of this 20 mole percent isobutane, and then I, um, have my pure n-butane, introduce it to the reactor, get my isobutane as the product, and then I recycle back my isobutane to the feed to basically um, mix it with this isobutane before the reaction step. So uh, yeah, we have two, two options here for this design. Which one is better, right? How do you make the decision about which one should you, should you do? 
So this will depend on, on a bunch of things, right? It will depend on your temperature, on your, um, how, how fast, how big is this reactor, um, economics, of course. Are there any heuristics guiding this design? Not really, because there is um, maybe the heuristic about recycling the in a reversible reaction. However, isobutane is not a byproduct, it's the main product. So there, there isn't really a heuristic which is directly dealing with this. So now you have to make a decision, and this decision will depend on your economics. And you have to remember that in this case, so in option A, my reactor will be a big unit because this is where I feed my recycle stream. And my separator might not be a very big unit, might be on the smaller side. Versus on um, option B, my separation is a very large unit versus my reactor, which would be a much smaller unit. Okay. So uh, you cannot, this, this is the type of decision which, which will be governed by the economics, governed by the catalyst. You know, how active, how selective is this catalyst? You know, is this, does this reaction go to 90% conversion? Or, you know, where is my equilibrium? Is my equilibrium closer to the left-hand side, right-hand side? So when you have these options at this level when building your base case, you just need to make a judgment call. And then once you get to the detailed design, you should be prepared to switch them around. Okay, <clears throat> moving on. Um, heuristic number 43, again, just to recap. You should always remember that um, to increase the pressure of a stream, you need to pump a liquid rather than compress a gas, right? So again, I'm just reiterating this. It's always better to pump your pump a liquid than to compress a gas in order to increase the pressure of the system. As long as um, you don't need refrigeration. Okay, so an example for this. <clears throat> ethyl benzene is to be taken from storage at 25 degrees Celsius on one atmosphere and fed to a styrene reactor at 400 Celsius and five atmosphere at a rate of 100,000 pounds per hour. Find two alternatives for positioning the temperature and pressure increase operations. So what's happening here? Let's uh, analyze it closely. Ethyl benzene, I'm taking it from 25 Celsius on one atmosphere and feeding it to a reactor at 400 Celsius and five atmosphere. Basically, I need to change, basically um, change both the temperature and pressure of this ethyl benzene, move it from 25 Celsius to 400 Celsius, and move it from one atmosphere to five atmospheres. So what are the two alternatives? Maybe I could heat it first and then compress it, or compress it first and then heat it, right? Which, which option is better, right? So let, let's draw them and let's let's have a look here. And so this these are results from a simulation. And as you can see, your ethyl benzene. First of all, I pump it from one atmosphere to five atmosphere at the same temperature, and then I um, I heat it at five atmosphere to four hundred Celsius um, at the same pressure, right? So. Again, I have ethyl benzene. I want to move it from 25 degrees Celsius on one atmosphere. I want to move it to 400 Celsius and five atmosphere. In this top diagram, I pump it first from one atmosphere to five atmosphere, and then I heat it from 25 Celsius to 400 Celsius. And the thing to keep an eye on here are your heat duties, right? Let's have a look at the heat duties here. Your heat duties is 2.69 times 10 to the four BTU per hour, 4.63 times 10 to the seven BTU per hour. Okay, let's compare them to the second scenario. We're in the second scenario. I have my ethyl benzene at 25 Celsius on one atmosphere. I, I heat them up first. So I heat it up first from 25 Celsius to 352 Celsius, whatever it is. And then I compress this gas further to get to my final point, 400 Celsius and five atmosphere. So, um, and of course, I did not heat it to 400 Celsius because when you compress a gas, you also increase its temperature. So what we did here is we used something called, and this is an Aspen and HiSIS is basically the version of Aspen used in industry. They have sort of an optimization tool where, you know, how much should I heat it for to get this compression step to get me to 400 Celsius. Anyway, so here I heat, heated my 
um, ethyl benzene first and then compressed it. And if I look at my heat flows here, it's 4.18 times 10 to the 7. And my heat flow 4.543 times 10 to the 6. And if I add these two numbers and compare them to these two numbers, it seems that the top case takes a lot less energy, right? So let's have a look here. If you compare the heating, so in both cases, whether I'm heating a liquid or heating a gas, the duties seem to be similar, right? However, the huge difference is in pumping or pumping versus compression, right? So pumping this, um, pumping this, uh, sorry, this liquid, sorry. Uh, yeah, pumping this liquid requires significantly less energy than compressing this gas. And this goes back to the heuristic where it's always cheaper to pump a liquid than to compress a gas. Okay. And here we just compared them. So I have ethyl benzene in the liquid state, 25 Celsius, one atmosphere. I want to get it to 400 Celsius and five atmosphere where it's a gas. So I either pump the liquid and then heat it or pump or basically heat the gas and then or sorry, heat the liquid and then compress it. Okay, let's have a look at the last example here, state transition. And this comes back to this heuristic where we're talking about compressing a liquid versus, um, <clears throat> sorry, we're talking about pumping a liquid versus compressing a gas. And if you don't recognize this or you, you're having a hard time remembering this, you can ignore it, but this is from your thermodynamics, pressure versus enthalpy curves, um, where basically I have a liquid, liquid plus vapor. Vapor is basically a phase diagram, but expressed in terms of P versus H. On option number one, where I'm basically heating first, and then um, pumping, go from the liquid, liquid plus vapor, vapor. So. In this option, I heat my liquid and then um, pump my vapor versus option number two, where I basically pump my liquid and then heat my liquid, right? So the, these are the two options here. Here I pump my liquid, increase its pressure, and then heat it to get to my final point. And as you can see here that um, the enthalpy, or, you know, if, if you, if, if you're interested in, in, in calculating or thermodynamically, basically you will still get from point A to point B. So thermodynamically you're doing you're achieving the same thing. However, the amount of overall energy you're gonna exert in option number two is significantly lower than that in option number one. Okay. So again, just to recap, and I'm uh, I've repeated this many times now. Always pump a liquid versus compressing a gas. Okay. All right, let's uh, let's wrap up this this, uh, this thing. So summary design heuristics. So we covered sixteen design heuristics, which will help you understand the importance of selecting reaction paths that don't involve toxic or hazardous chemicals, and reduce their presence by either shortening the residence time or avoiding their storage. So if you have intermediates, which are toxic, hazardous, whatever it is, you want to avoid them completely or um, convert them into a species which is less toxic or less hazardous. You should always account for the presence of inert species um, you by either purging them or recycling them for some heat effects, whatever it is. Um, always apply your heuristics and selecting separation processes to separate liquids, vapors, and vapor-liquid mixtures. Um, distribute your chemicals to remove exothermic heats of reaction. Understand the advantages of pumping a liquid rather than compressing a vapor. Okay, so this is the end of this, um, um, this lecture, week number three. Um, there won't be so remember by next week, September. So, this is this will be September 7th, September 14th. Next week, homework one is due. Your project selections are due. Please, um, um, do them. And uh, just a reminder that we have office hours all day Thursday. The link is posted on Blackboard. And anytime you need help, just send me an email. We can have a we can have office hours by appointment. And, um, and, you know, please make sure you don't fall behind. Thank you very much.